It's the spring of 1981, and you, a big-time computer enthusiast, can't believe how much this hobby you love has grown. In just a few short years, the machines have quickly turned into something you had only ever hoped for. Innovations seem to be happening quicker than ever. But in computer shops and tech clubs, there are whispers of something new on the horizon. Something that just might change the world you know forever. I'm Jamie Logie, and this is Everything 80s, a podcast that looks back on a decade that forever changed the way we dress, consume, and connected. And today, it's a trip back to the era when the PC quickly became a part of all of our lives, and the one machine that changed the industry and the world forever. This is the history of the IBM PC 5150. I'm not sure how old you were in the early 80s, but in the late 70s and into the early 80s, did you know anyone with a computer? I was pretty young in the early 80s, but was obsessed with technology, and I don't remember anyone with a computer. I'm not sure I even saw one in person until well into the mid 80s. It was my cousin's, and I remember how weird it seemed because his computer used cassette tapes. But going into the 80s, the average person probably didn't see a computer that often either. Because, honestly, for the average person, there wasn't much point in them. Computers were for hobbyists, corporations, or extreme tech fans. As IBM even shares on its own website, going into the 80s, a computer barely made sense for a business executive or student to own one, let alone the average consumer. This, however, was all going to change in 1981. This won't be as much of a technical overview of the IBM PC, but more about the new approach to get a PC into the hands of the average consumer and how this machine ended up changing everything. We need to begin this story by heading back to the mid-1970s. This is a time when IBM introduced some new machines, like the IBM 5100, a 50-pound 50 portable computer. At a hefty price tag of $20,000, or around $113,000 today, this machine was primarily for corporate use. Also in the 1970s were some big innovations such as CPM, the first commercially successful operating system for microcomputers. The company behind it, Intergalactic Digital Research, and later just called Digital Research, even has a significant connection to this story that we'll get back to in a bit. In 1978, the first computer is installed in the White House, a Hewlett-Packard HP 3000. Also installed in the White House, a Xerox Alto. This Xerox computer used a graphical user interface, or GUI, meaning your actions were carried out through the use of graphics and icons on the screen. This is the machine and the GUI that would have a big impact on some employees from a newer company called Apple that were visiting Xerox. The functionality and graphical user interface made a big impression on the head of this company, as Steve Jobs also plays a huge role in changing the personal computer industry forever. But while this was going on, Another company that Jobs had previously worked for, called Atari, released the Atari Video Computer System, better known as the 2600. But when it came to actual computers, Atari also released the Model 400 and 800, a series of 8-bit home computers. Video games were the priority for the 2600, and 
this would still be the big focus of the 400 and 800, but these were real computers. With the advanced computing power over the Atari 2600, the 400 and 800 could serve other functions, like balancing your checkbook or writing letters. Video games and computing are evolving quickly, and as we enter the 1980s, it's still the same story though. A computer seemed to only appeal to hobbyists, and now video game lovers. What impact could they have on the average person? The big computer companies at the time made their money by selling their machines to businesses. But was there some promise for a home or personal computer that could make life easier? Could a computer grow beyond just a niche object and become a regular consumer item? This is when William Lowe enters the picture. It's the year 1980, and William Lowe is the IBM General Systems Division Lab Director. Computing power is going up, and prices, though still expensive, are coming down. At some point, the two will intersect, and higher-end computing power won't cost a small fortune. The giant computer mainframes of the 1960s were being shrunk down to something that could fit on a desk. Lowe sees a future that includes the personal computer and envisions how computers will become a tool and part of our everyday lives. According to IBM.com, 1980 is when Lowe pitches the idea to IBM CEO Frank Carey. He pitches the idea of a computer targeted towards individuals and small businesses. Not only is the idea of a personal computer still relatively novel, but Lowe also pitches something else extraordinary. The machine would only cost $1,500. Still a lot for a unique machine, but light years better than, say, the IBM 5100 and its $20,000 price tag. But Carey was on board with one big caveat. Lowe only had a month to create a prototype and a year to get the product into the market. The timeline seems almost impossible. Just 30 days to create something that didn't really exist yet. But it was time to get to work. Under the project name of Chess, this wasn't going to be the first personal computer, as the Apple I, the Apple II, the Commodore PET, and the TRS-80 were some of those other PC options. But hopefully for IBM, their new machine would be the first PC that made an even bigger splash and went truly mainstream. IBM, the huge corporate machine, was the opposite to all the startups popping up in Silicon Valley who wanted to take the industry in a new direction. But IBM had also been sitting back and watching what was happening with all the personal computers released through the 70s. They were getting a good idea of what was working and, just as importantly, what wasn't working. For the team working on what would become the 5150, there were a lot of procedures and regulations to follow at IBM. Procedures and regulations that could eat up a lot of time when designing a new computer. According to the Modern Classic YouTube channel, the design process was going so slowly that William Lowe brought up the idea of buying Atari. By owning Atari, they would own the 400 and 800 computer. And instead of engineering something from scratch, they could just modify the existing 800s. But that didn't exactly go over well with the IBM board. So if they were going to get this thing done in time, it would mean working without the restrictions of company procedures. And they were allowed this. 
Project Chess turned into what's called a Skunk Works project, a rogue project, if you will, free from any corporate restraints while still remaining under the IBM umbrella. Don Estridge was put in the position of developing the IBM PC, and this led to some radical and unorthodox design and production. Other members of the team include Jack Sams, Bill Sidness, Dave Bradley, Mark Dean, and Dennis Moeller. Between them, they worked on things like software, writing the interface code, or creating the IBS bus, the part of the machine that allows disk drives and a printer to communicate with the computer. With fewer restraints, one of the first big moves takes place. A good chunk of this new machine would be made up of parts from another machine IBM created. It was called the IBM System 23 Data Master. This all-in-one computer used an Intel 8-bit processor, a built-in monitor, and two 8-inch floppy disk drives. The Data Master was another machine meant to be used by people who weren't computer specialists. The Data Master ended up being released just before the 5150, but would still cost around $9,000, or nearly $30,000 in today's money. This machine inadvertently led to the success of the 5150. As the Data Master walked, so the 5150 could run. Several parts of the Data Master, like the keyboard, expansion bus, display, monitors, and floppy interface, were taken straight from it to use on the new IBM PC. Talk about a huge time saver. And honestly, the only way to get this thing out in time. The baseline model of the IBM 5150 at the advertised price didn't include a floppy disk or monitor, but you had the ability to hook it up to your home TV. Next came the operating system and microprocessor. Normally, IBM made all these things in-house, but with the handcuffs off and time of the essence, the design team decided to use more off-the-shelf parts. This was also an ideal way to keep the cost down and hit that $1,500 price tag. And time really is the critical component of this whole thing that changed the world of computers forever. Technology was moving so quickly that companies needed to get machines out fast or risk them becoming obsolete by the time they hit shelves. When you combine the manufacturing process along with the marketing and promotion to make the public aware of a new product, back then, you're looking at a four to five year process. The PC market seemed to be moving quicker with each passing day. Another big decision was choosing Intel's 8088 chip. The 16-bit central processing unit or CPU is found on the motherboard of a computer and is basically the brain or heart of all the digital systems in the computer. The 8088 came out in the late 70s and required fewer and less expensive support chips than the 8086 chip that came out a few years prior. The Intel 8088 chip could run up to 5 megahertz. A future version could run up to 16 megahertz. Now, these days, my technical knowledge is at a level where my three-year-old nephew knows more than I do, but megahertz is like the clock speed of a computer and how fast it runs. It's like a metronome that sets the pace for the system. One megahertz equals one million ticks or cycles per second. The IBM PC could run up to five million cycles per second. And some context on the evolution of computing power. If you're listening to this podcast on a newer iPhone with the A15 Bionic chip, those can run up to 3.24 gigahertz. 
The architecture is different between a desktop and a phone, and the process is more complicated. But for a simplistic example, the IBM 5150 ran up to 5 million cycles per second. Your iPhone can run up to 3.2 billion cycles per second. Further proof that these aren't phones, but remarkable computers that fit in our pockets. This processor could also address one megabyte of physical memory, which was quite significant at the time. With its internals, the 5150 would be able to handle more complex programs than some of its pre-existing competitors. These are all minuscule numbers today, of course, but still quite impressive for the time, especially at that price point. Many of the PCs built in the years to come feature CPUs that can be traced back to that Intel 8088 microprocessor. Project Chess really was an unorthodox and rogue project. One of the key concepts of the 5150 was the idea of open architecture. According to IBM.com, the team, quote, even published a technical reference of the circuit designs and source codes to help companies develop software and peripherals, unquote. Peripherals are any external device that can connect to your computer to expand its capabilities. So the hardware and internals are coming together. But if this was to be a computer for the masses, it needed to be a bit more user-friendly. So what kind of OS or operating system would run on it? I mentioned earlier about the company called Digital Research that created one of the early commercial operating systems for microcomputers. And they were in the mix to provide the OS for the 5150. This obviously didn't happen, but it's one of those interesting what-ifs that could have had a profound effect on the history of computers, software, and tech. Instead, a still relatively new company ended up changing the computing world forever. Enter what will eventually become known as the Microsoft Disk Operating System, better known as MS-DOS. Everything 80s will return after these messages. Founded in 1975 by Bill Gates and Paul Allen, Microsoft's goal was to develop software for one of the early PCs called the Altair 8800. The company quickly established itself as the largest producer of computer programming languages. According to PC Magazine, in July 1980, IBM sent their head of software, Jack Sams, to meet with Microsoft. The meeting seemed like a regular meet and greet without too much discussion of what was being worked on. When the 5150 was officially greenlit, Sam's and some others went back to Microsoft. They were interested in licensing one of Microsoft's languages like COBOL, BASIC, Pascal, or Fortran. There are a lot of variations to this story, but according to PCMag.com, Bill Gates actually referred IBM over to digital research, even getting the founder of digital research on the phone to set up a meeting for IBM the next day. Regardless of whatever the true story is, the point is that IBM didn't work with digital research on an operating system and went back to Microsoft. Through all the back and forth, including the story that the deal happened because the mothers of Bill Gates and the CEO of IBM were friends, Microsoft eventually agreed to, quote, coordinate the software development process for the PC. IBM agreed to pay Microsoft, quote, $45,000 for what would end up being called DOS, $310,000 for the various 16-bit languages, and $75,000 for adaptations, testing, and consultations, unquote. This seemed like a pretty good deal. 
IBM was expecting Microsoft to ask for even more money. But Microsoft envisioned something better. They wanted to sell what would become MS-DOS to other companies. That was a smart move, as this software would help launch Microsoft into a powerhouse, as according to Computer History Museum from ComputerHistory.org. Even though many companies in the 80s would imitate IBM's hardware, most would license MS-DOS. This then led to Windows in 1985, then Microsoft Office, Windows 95, Windows XP, the Xbox, and so on, as Microsoft became one of the biggest and most valuable companies in history. So according to a 2021 Wired article, here's what the timeline for the IBM PC looks like. After the idea is pitched by William Lowe, a prototype is presented on August 8, 1980 to the Corporate Management Committee. They approve of the basic plan and the full go-ahead is given to the project now dubbed ACORN. We're now in January 1981 and Project ACORN is being demonstrated to people within IBM. And eventually, as we head into the summer of 1981, the IBM personal computer 5150, quickly dubbed the IBM PC, is finally unveiled in New York City. That date was August 12th, 1981, almost an exact year from the day the first prototype was presented. The 5150 is set to hit shelves in just a few months, but what will the response be? Would it appeal to the average citizen? Was there even room for it in the PC market? The Apple II computer, with its unique color graphics, made a pretty significant splash when it was released in the late 70s. According to the Library of Congress, sales of the Apple II went from 7.8 million in 1978 to 117 million in 1980. That's quite the jump in just two years. This was also the year that Apple went public. So was this the ceiling for the personal computer? Was Apple going to run away with control of the PC market? Was it possible for anything to achieve even better success? The 5150 would turn the entire industry on its head. A product is only as good as people's awareness of it. You can have the best product in the world, but if very few people see it or hear about it, it's almost like it doesn't exist. IBM had a new entry to the PC market. And just as important as the innovations behind the 5150 and the price was letting consumers know this was for them. This wasn't a scary computer that you needed a PhD to operate, but an accessible, user-friendly machine that could become part of your regular life. A PC could help you with your taxes, balance your checkbook, store recipes for you, help kids learn to read and write, and let you create short stories, poems, or write letters to friends and family. Artists could design pictures on them, and musicians could compose music. With the IBM PC, you could learn a new language, and even play games on it. The 5150 was intended as a machine for the masses, and that meant a strategic marketing approach was needed. This began with its first commercial campaign. The very first computers seemed as big as houses. And so mysterious that for most of us, the computer was behind a closed door. But IBM was thinking how to make the computer more useful. And as one good idea led to another, it began getting smaller, faster, less expensive, and easier to use. The one-minute, light-hearted commercial spot was set against a white background and featured the little tramp character made famous by Charlie Chaplin. The theme of the quite brilliant marketing campaign was called Keeping Up with Modern Times. By using a classic and familiar character like the Little Tramp, 
IBM made this machine feel almost quaint and, as was their primary intent, accessible. The print ads for the IBM PC also leaned into the accessibility of this machine and how, quote, it could soon be on your desk, in your home, or your child's classroom, unquote. The print ad played up the fact that the technology was shrinking and getting easier to use. Even though this machine costs $1,600, it not only allows you to be productive, but creative. Do you love to write? Buy a 5150 and have all your stories and creations saved in one place. No more notebooks, writing by hand, or hammering something out on an old-fashioned typewriter. By leaning into the creativity side, IBM made this machine seem less industrial and more like a tool, like an artist's paintbrush. IBM also appealed to the desires of families with children trying to seamlessly blend their work and family life. The print ads for the 5150 said it could, quote, help a business forecaster improve his planning ability just as surely as it will help a small child improve their vocabulary, unquote. Yes, $1,600 was a lot in 1981. That's over $5,000 in today's money. But doesn't that seem like a small investment to help little Johnny or Susie learn to read? But make no mistake, IBM still made everyone aware this was a state-of-the-art machine, and computer enthusiasts should still want it. It had high-resolution graphics and user-defined function keys. Memory could be expanded up to 256 kilobytes, and a printer could even be added for word processing. The IBM PC 5150 was officially launched in August 1981 and would be in stores within a few months. Along with the commercial campaign was another unique way to get it onto shelves. And that meant the right shelves, and that meant new sales channels. If computer shops were for computer-minded people, the 5150 needed to be in a place where the average consumer shopped. And in the 80s, this was a place most of us stepped foot into, or at the very least, read their catalogs, Sears. The IBM PC would be available at the Sears Business Systems Center. But that doesn't mean IBM was avoiding the computer-minded people in the computer shops. Far from it, as in the US, the 5150 also launched in 150 Computerland locations. Computerland goes back to the mid-70s. After the launch of the 5150, the service store grew to 190 locations. And due to the rapid success of the PC, by 1985, had exploded to 800 locations in the US with another 200 outside the country. The IBM PC was an instant hit. According to Wired.com, in just four months, IBM sold 65,000 5150s. An astonishing 100,000 orders were taken by the Christmas of 1981. Some reports say that the IBM team built and delivered 250,000 machines within months and not the five-year time span the company projected. Either way, this thing was a monster hit dominating microcomputer sales. According to a 1983 New York Times article, IBM sold between 175,000 and 200,000 more computers in 1982. For 1983, that number was to go up to a half million machines. In 1982, the IBM PC accounted for up to $2 billion of IBM's yearly revenue. IBM.com says that by the end of 1982, a new retailer was signing up every week. And at its peak, during normal business hours, Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., IBM was selling a machine every minute. 
So many 5150s were being sold that independent computer shop owners were worried it would dominate store sales to the point they would just be seen as an IBM distributor. Despite being aimed at the average person, it was the business and corporate world that fully embraced the 5150. As mentioned, personal or home computers had been around for years, but the fact IBM now made them was the seal of approval. The headline for their print ads even said, quote, presenting the IBM of personal computers, which feels like how we say that someone is the Michael Jordan of whatever they're good at. IBM knew they were the elite standard, and that was reflected in their product. And above all, IBM wanted the world to know that the age of the personal computer didn't arrive until IBM said it arrived. The fact that the giant company had thrown its hat into the personal computer ring legitimized the PC and showed businesses it was a worthwhile machine. IBM had built itself and its reputation on creating machines for businesses. They were international business machines, after all. The company goes all the way back to 1911, when they started as a holding company for record-keeping before moving into punch card tabulating systems. IBM's credibility showed businesses that the 5150 wasn't a toy or just for hobbyists, but an important tool for the business world going forward. This thing wasn't a giant Atari 2600 or a speak and spell, but a necessity for any business. According to computerhistory.org, it was businesses and corporations that bought the 5150 in huge quantities, and eventually it reached the desk at every corporate level. The success of the 5150 also led to the rapidly expanding world of software. Quickly, spreadsheets and word processing software were introduced that not only enhanced the 5150, but became another essential part of business life. The more versatile this machine became, the more sales it led to, which led to even more programs and more sales. It was a true technological snowball effect. Between the success of the Apple II and now the IBM PC, the computer age seemed to truly be upon us. A December 1981 CBS Evening News report told us that, quote, industry experts say we're no longer on the verge of the personal computer revolution. We're right in the midst of it, thank you, and it's gathering steam with more and more people jumping aboard every day, unquote. At the end of 1982, Time Magazine put out their January 1983 issue. The cover of Time, which usually showcased a famous person of the year, instead featured the PC. The headline was, The Computer Moves In, and the PC was dubbed the Machine of the Year. What seemed like a niche hobby done in garages and basements just a few years earlier was now a multi-billion dollar business. And in that 1981 CBS report, Dan Estridge from IBM also mentioned something interesting, something that didn't necessarily make sense to people back in 1981. He said that the IBM 5150 could, quote, communicate with other personal computers over the telephone line. And who knows? It may be the world's biggest backyard fence to talk over before long, unquote. I'm sure at some point you've either owned or used a personal computer. Many of those PCs or laptop computers you've had over the years are direct descendants of the IBM 5150. The launch of the IBM PC marked a significant period in the history of computers, and especially the personal or home computer. The 5150 quickly became the benchmark 
for not only hardware compatibility, but software too. Eventually, third-party manufacturers created IBM-compatible components and software. By using off-the-shelf components, it was easier for other companies to produce compatible hardware and software. The open architecture allowed for a more open ecosystem and helped in the rapid growth of the personal computer. The PC was now mainstream. With the 5150, businesses could make better use of a computer as could the average person. $1,600 was a lot of money in 1981, but for all the benefits this machine could provide, it almost seemed like a steal. The price clearly didn't deter a lot of people, and it still feels like the same case today if you want the latest and best tech. Here in Canada, the latest and highest end iPhone with one terabyte of storage goes for nearly $2,400. And it may even be outdated by the time you hear this podcast. The success of the IBM 5150 led to a PC boom, which gave us new machines like the Apple IIe and eventually the Macintosh. And just a year after the IBM PC came the machine that is considered the best-selling computer of all time, the Commodore 64. In the year 1980, sales of PCs were around 700,000 units. This went up to 1.4 million units in 1981, and then up to 3 million in 1982. But it was the 5150 that ushered in the new era of the personal computer, or PC, a term that prior to its release, many people were not yet familiar with. But soon, we all learned how the PC would become a critical part of our lives. And on that note, it's time to end. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's plenty more where that came from. So be sure to dive back into my earlier episodes. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the Everything 80s podcast wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss out on new episodes. If you're looking for bonus 80s audio content, like the Everything 80s Movie Review podcast, you can consider becoming a part of patreon.com. That's a platform to not only support the show, but get that bonus content. If you want to learn more, just head on over to patreon.com slash 80s. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash 80s or click on the link in the description. So thank you again so much for spending your time with me here today. You are the MS-DOS to my 5150. I'm Jamie. This has been Everything 80s, but I'll be back soon with a new episode. Don't you dare miss it.